Ricky Gambino, uh, we came across a number of years ago in Birmingham, England. And without rehashing everything yesterday about him, uh, he was uh, preaching for the Summer Lang congregation, and they had been known for their liberalism, and we thought through what he was revealing and what contacts had been made that he was going to help that church turn around uh, and head more toward the right direction. And in the process of things, about maybe two and a half to three years ago, after we had met him, thereabouts anyway, he had um, uh, departed from the faith after we had met him. And then he all of a sudden, and we're keeping up with him on these various um, lists. So all of a sudden he's back on the list and he's, he's changing, coming the other direction now toward, toward the truth. So to make a long story short, he was here at these lectures two years ago. And we were glad to have him. And I want to make a comment just here. I'll kind of start the back of what he said. And, and nobody's uh, wanting to see him hurt, but uh, we're dealing with the doctrine. We're dealing with accusations he's made. But here's what he does say. I love my time with all brethren and the kindness shown to me by all, especially uh, Ken Cohn and his family. Uh, I love you and no matter what will always do so. Well, you know, that seems to be the whole thing. I love you. Now let's just disagree all we want to, and you're right and you're wrong, and that's incorrect. But I love you, so there's the unity and diversity. That's exactly what that is. Love being, you can disagree in all these things, but love binds it all together, and so we can fuss and fume and disagree, but it's all right. That sort of defeats the purpose of arguing a point. Now, a lot of people don't understand. Their idea of arguing is these spats and fusses to get into. But when you, when you make a case and you argue a point, you're proving something or disproving it. So it's not just some sort of a banter back and forth and like two, three-year-old fussing in a sand pile. Nothing like that. Sometimes it's been done that way, but that's not what's supposed to be. Now, since he said that, and we acknowledge that, and I've enjoyed personally visiting with him, so it has nothing to do with that. I think I can say that for all these folks that have met him. He's, he's, in, he's enjoyable to be around. That has nothing to do with what we're trying to do. It is a matter of, is he abiding by the teachings of Christ? Or is he right, and we're not abiding by the teachings of Christ? Well, the Bible is the only way, as long as everybody has honest and good hearts, that one can settle that question. Now, are we willing in all things, as we declare to everybody who believes in Christ, are we willing in all things to let the Bible settle the matter? Now, if it's not to be able to settle differences on religion, of what worth is it? So keep that in mind. He said at first here, first of all, my spelling was mentioned. I was unaware that spelling mistakes were made. You must realize that there is American English as well as UK English, and we do. And my spell check would revert to the UK if in error forgive grammar also. That was not the point at all. No one was picking on his spelling. We all, when we type, <laughs> typing on these lists, it gets rather interesting. Uh, you probably need to study Greek and then write it backwards to realize what some people write when they make mistakes on these things. Yours truly included and everybody writes a shorthand or garbledly whatever. Well, that's not the point. The point is, if you have the work of the Holy Spirit in you, like Paul and others did, then I don't think you ought to be making any kind of mistake when you write, if he's guiding you in writing what it is that you're writing. I don't think there was any mistake in any of the original autographs of any kind whatsoever of the Scriptures. I don't think there were. That's the point I think Michael was making. He might want to comment on that more. But that's, that's all there was to it. So we weren't just picking on anybody from that standpoint. Then he said it was made mention, it's easier for me to sit behind a computer to ask questions. Well, it is. The open forum was for people like me to ask questions. No doubt sitting behind a computer, I thought, question mark. Again, he misses the point. The point was is that we were willing to meet him in public debate face-to-face -face in Birmingham, England, 
and he would have a chance to deal with us. We've dealt with him before, but he, that's the only negotiations. And tell me if I'm wrong, Ken. We entered into negotiations with the idea of a public uh, debate, not a sit-down Bible study. Now, nobody's opposed to a sit-down Bible study. We have had them with him. That's the way we met him and the way things started. I would think that during the time he was with Ken, there were discussions between one another on various topics. Well, that's a form of Bible study. If that's what you're trying to do, understand the Bible in those discussions. So he's missing the point there. Uh, yes, we want everybody, and I hope they're listening now, we want everybody to join in through the computer. We invite questions in even as these have come in. But he had the opportunity, since he was condemning us for weeks on end on these um, forums, or not forums, but these lists, that he, that's why we approached him and started negotiating with him. So at that point, it, he misses it here. In relation to me not wishing to meet brethren, this is his other point, uh, when they were over, that is in fact not true. I said I would meet with brethren to discuss issues. Now, let's stop right there. The issues are already being discussed online and had been for many weeks. That's why that I got a hold of Ken and I said, we're going to be over there. I can try to stay longer, uh, but we've got to see what he's going to do. We went so far as to say, because things operate different in the way people do their whatever over there. We said, well, we can have a debate like we had over here Monday, Tuesday, skip Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I nearly knew that wouldn't work because of the way things work over there. But then we said, okay. Uh, if you can't do that, then we will have debate just on the weekend. But well, we're going to have four sessions. You're going to be in the affirmative, and I'm going to be in the affirmative, and we have a full discussion. If I remember correctly, and I think we still have all these emails, I said I will, I will debate on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and one time on Sunday and wind it up. We offered him that. And then he says, though, uh, I said I would meet with brethren to discuss the issues. And then he acts like it's in more or less a private sit-down. We never approached him on that. That was already taking place, and he knows that. He says, now, if I recall, Ken was over at the time, and a time could be arranged. I gave my reasons with proof. I don't know what that means, other than his job, which, by the way, he's a policeman, had different time changes. He says, I gave my reason with proof why I could not meet at that time. But I said I would meet with the brethren here who had contact with him to go over any issues. No mention was made about those overstaying longer. That means past the lectureship that we go over there to. I won't go into detail of this, but can if you wish. Um, that's just not the way it was, and it's in print. It was a matter of a public discussion and a formal debate thing, and that's the way he was approached, and it's in print. And the proof is, is that's the way it was. Uh, I never had in my mind, and we did not present it to him that way, and the record still reads that way, that we would enter into some sort of discussion privately. Uh, we could have, but that was not what we proposed. Now, he says something here you all have to deal with. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I'll say, y'all, or maybe you can. I don't know. He said, I also made mention that I had previously asked for proof against an accusation against me. You know what he's talking about? I don't recall what he was about. I was told it would be provided within six weeks. I have no idea. I, I wasn't on the list. I got into the thing when we started trying to set up a public formal debate. It never was forthcoming. And then he puts in parentheses, that's a side issue. Point is, why it's wrong for me and not in you? I don't. In other words, he's trying to say we're inconsistent. I just don't know what he's talking about. Some of you who were uh, involved with him in whatever he's talking about, uh, I don't know whether Keith had made some, Keith Sisman. I have no idea. So, uh, Ricky, in all honesty, you'll have to supply what you're talking about here, and we'll try to deal with it. Uh, then he comes along and says, uh, on the instrumental music, I felt the answer at the most was weak. Well, it doesn't make any difference how people, f let me just say this, how they feel about it. Uh, you know, to prove something is not necessarily to prove it to a certain individual. You can prove something and prove it as well as it can be proven. 
Doesn't mean I proved it to you. For all sorts of reasons, it might not be proved true to you. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus Christ, in the record that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of his life, did he prove himself to be the Son of God? What did the uh, scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests think about it? Well, does that mean because they didn't accept and it wasn't proven to them that he didn't do his job to prove? John uh, 20, 30, and 31 says he did, and the miracles did it. So he's got to understand just for me to say, well, I just don't think that did it. Well, you know, a person can make an argument, and every time he gets through it, he says, well, I just don't think that did it. <laughs> That's convenient. Uh, he says, oh, uh, concerning the Old Testament, it was said, and you agreed that instrumental music was in the Old Testament and heaven, but not in the New Testament church or even today. Well, I thought that was answered. I thought it was clear. In fact, um, Daniel went into detail on the matter of uh, things in heaven and so forth. We emphasize we're to do only Colossians 3.17, what's authorized by the New Testament. That necessitates knowing how the last will and testament authorizes us to do anything. And it also shows we have to know how to determine what is obligatory and what is not. I thought all of that stuff was discussed. And besides that, let me remind Ricky, you've got in your library, I know because I saw it, enough information to explain this to you without us having to do it. You can read it all day long every day. It's there. I saw it, on, unless you've thrown it away. Uh, it's there. I saw. In fact, you'll remember, Ricky, that I told you you had some very good books. That if you would stay with those books, they would help you a whole lot. So um, I don't know what he's doing when he says that. And he st goes ahead and says, I still don't see where it was ever stopped. That is what was in the Old Testament or what he thinks is in heaven. Uh, well, I can't help but you don't see. Look, I remember one time it was being told that there was a, when Brother Hardiman was over at Freed Hardiman, this goes a long time ago, and he taught a certain class. And the person that was telling me this was in that class. And he was trying to show from the New Testament that a part of Christian conduct and the laws that govern how we live would not allow for Christians to participate in uh, the dancing that normally goes on. And this one student kept saying, well, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Well, he had in that class another student, a, a girl, who had uh, been born blind. She had never uh, had any sight. So he had her, it was on a beautiful, clear day, he had her walk over to, called her name, said, would you go over to the window? And a beautiful, clear, sunny day, he said, uh, whatever her name was, do you see the sun? And she said, no, Brother Hardiman, you know I don't see the sun. I've never seen anything. And then Brother Hardiman made his application. Just because she doesn't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And that's what's wrong with him. I still don't see where it was ever stopped. Well, open your eyes. <laughs> open the eyes that are necessary for thinking and understanding and check yourselves to see whether you're really honest with yourself, with God, and with the Bible and willing to understand these things. He says, you mentioned the tuning fork pitch pipe would be used to start the worship as such. It matters not if started, it's being used. Well, he thinks that when you get a pitch, that's, that's part of the worship. John, where are you? Do you have your pitch pipe? I want, I want you to come up, and somebody else can help on this. I, I want you, first of all, to give me the definition of what uh, 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 music is. Can you do that? I know that fellow sitting over there can. How do you distinguish what music is? What a song is? What a melody is from this? Okay, well, music in general is, is making a sound. You can make a sound on an instrument or you can make a sound vocally. Uh, if you use a mechanical instrument of music, you're making a sound with a mechanical instrument. Okay, this pitch pipe, or case be a tuning fork, is a type of instrument. If you've never seen a little pitch pipe, if this is a chromatic pitch pipe. I have a C to C. They're, they're on different scales. C to C is the most common. Meaning it starts with middle C, if you know anything about music, low C, uh, which we consider a lower C, and goes to a higher C. It's chromatic in that it, it does not just give you the main note through the eight note scale and then on back to uh, C again, but it gives you the sharps and the flats in between. Now if you take this little pitch pipe and you try to play a song on it, you're going to have a very, very hard time. Can it be done? Very slowly it can be. 
Can you do it and keep up with the tempo of a music? No, you can't. I could take a trumpet or I could take a piano and I could do that. But you cannot do with this chromatic pitch pipe. For instance, if we take a song, whatever song it may be, heaven will surely be worth it all. This is in the key of F. I can take my pitch pipe, blow an F. Hmm. I get that pitch. The pitch pipe, folks, goes back in my pocket. Ricky, if you're watching this, we're not playing during the singing. The pitch pipe goes back into my pocket. I can then get my songbook and begin singing without the aid of mechanical instruments of music. We sing vocally, verbally, as Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 not only so directs us but commands us without the aid of instrument. The argument he's using is totally false to begin with and people who try to push the instrumental music argument fail to understand a lot of things about the Bible. First of all, authority. Secondly, even logic. Matter of fact, Rick, if you were here, you could stop by the book display. Terry has several logic books. I think might aid in that. When you look at logic in this and look at the verse of Ephesians 5.19, this is an action that is engaged by every single individual in the audience who is participating in the worship. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, if that includes an instrument of music, Ricky, that would mean logically that every single person in the audience would have to have their own individual instrument in order to fulfill the command of Ephesians 5.19. So if you claim that you can worship with the instrument and you can do so acceptably to God, that would mean wherever you're worshiping, every individual must have their own instrument or they're still in violation of God's law if you want to use that to justify the instrument. Do all members where you attend, Ricky, use an instrument or do you have one or maybe a small band playing? See, logic still comes into it. If you want to justify the instrument, then you better justify it according to the way the verse is laid out in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, or you're still in violation of, of what you're even believing yourself, which is, by the way, false. It's already been proven over and over again yesterday and in sermons in the past that the instrument is not authorized in the New Testament. What was done in the Old Testament was nailed to the cross, and Ricky, you even said that in your email yesterday. It was nailed to the cross, but you still didn't see where instrumental music is The problem is you don't see. And if you would open your eyes spiritually, you could see, but you're blinding yourself and you don't want to see. That's the problem. And I don't know that any matter of talking here today or even for the next five years would convince Ricky of any of this until he chooses himself to open his eyes and honestly study God's Word without prejudice of what others are doing or what others are saying or some false belief he has in his own mind. Let him look at the Word of God and open it up and quit using emotional arguments of I don't see, I don't think, I don't believe. Let's get back to what the Bible says and let God say, let God show, and He has through His Word, if you just look at it. I don't know if that answered that or no, not. I went into little well, bit. that's fine. Yeah, what, what really, with his deal here, when you, the, the, the uh, pitch back knows when to shut up. Yeah. And he does it. This uh, shuts up when the singing of a... And he can't use the, the song book to say it added because that helps you do only what God authorized you and exactly. specified to do. That's how you know the difference between an aid and addition. Uh, one other thing to add a little more on to it, as far as the, uh, and I don't remember the dictionary definition, but uh, when it comes to uh, music, uh, as far as uh, a melody, it takes an arrangement of notes. That thing was never meant. And besides that, there's not a soul on this earth who can sing without pitch. It may be the wrong pitch, but you can't sing without pitch. It's an impossibility. Now, that thing helps us get the right pitch. Now, some people can go do so re, re do and pretty well do it that way. Some people take a um, um, tuning fork and uh, they can hear it. You can't hear it. You try to take that thing and play a certain arrangement of notes on it. It was never meant for that. So Ricky doesn't know what he's talking about along that line, and evidently he won't let some of us help him to understand that. And that's all we're trying to do. David, you mentioned, uh, well, I'm just going to make a comment. You, you touched on it. I know it. <laughs> on, uh, the difference, Bruce Dalton, Huntsville, Texas. 
Uh, you touched on the difference between uh, aid and addition, but I think we might need to help them understand a little bit what that is. Uh, this microphone, you don't read about that in the New Testament, song books, song leaders, things like that. That's all to help us carry out the command to do things decently and in order so we all be on the same page with the same song, start at the same time, the right pitch. That's the same area in which the pitch pipe falls. The difference between a pitch pipe and a piano is the matter that the pitch pipe is an aid. It helps us to carry out the command in an expedient way. And a piano is an addition because it's another kind of music. And again, we could get into the difference between subordinate and coordinate and things like that, which is kind of confusing if you don't have time to go into it. But the, the fact is a piano is subordinate or coordinate with singing, okay? We either sing or we play. They're the same thing in relation to the general command of make music, okay? Do we understand that? They're equal in the idea of making music. What the problem is, God said very specifically the kind of music we're supposed to make in worship, and that's to sing. Now, that's what, we, that's what we're dealing with here. Pitch pipe helps us carry out the commandment to sing, and instrumental music is an addition to what we're supposed to be doing, which is sing. Let me see if I can illustrate. God made me with eyes to see. What do these glasses do? They help me see, and that's all they were ever made to do. It's not another kind of sight if there was something. And so that's just simply an aid. And that's what we mean by saying the book. In fact, often when I'm preaching on, uh, on this, I'll ask the song leader, are you authorized? Because you can't read of a song leader in the New Testament. Well, then where's our authority for it? Colossians 3.17 says we don't have a song leader. Because we'll do things decently in order. What is finger pointing over here? We won't go into that. Go ahead. Mm. Music I want to see. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> is the expression of ideas and emotions and significant forms through the elements of rhythm, melody, harmony, and color. A pitch pipe cannot do that by its very nature. All the pitch pipe does is it gets you a note to begin the melody. It doesn't play the melody. It gets you a note to begin to play the melody. And that's the reason we say the pitch pipe knows when to shut up. It, it gives us that. Okay. Hey, Dave. You brought this up, but 1 Corinthians 14, 40 does say, Let all things be done decently and in order. We read 1 Corinthians 14, 15, that we're the sing with the Spirit and sing with understanding. If we're doing these things and worshiping God as we should, should we not do our very best in our worship to God? Okay, if we're going to do that, then we want to make our singing to be as appropriate as possible. The Bible doesn't say we have to have the perfect pitch, and some people don't. But when we're here to do our very best in our worship and have our mind and our attitude in the right place, she would not want to do the very best. We're using a pitch pipe. All we're doing is pitching that song correctly so that we can sing and make melody in our hearts. But it goes back to the word sing. Uh, Daniel can go into the Greek on the word solo. All of us know it, but I know he can go in far more detail than any of us here probably and tell us more about the word solo. But it does simply, in a basic definition, to pluck, twitch, or twain, there said the strings of the heart. doesn't say anything about an instrument. It's the strings well, of a heart. Well, the, the instrument, instrument is, is the, the heart. heart. Yes. Yeah. But I, I'm referring to a mechanical instrument. It doesn't say to do that on a mechanical instrument. It tells us the strings of our hearts was plugged. Okay, we got about five minutes before we're supposed to go back there. I want to move real quickly over to the other subject that started a lot of this, and that's to have to do with miracles. And we, I don't know if we'll get as much detail into it as we did mechanical instrument or music or singing. But he says on point five, I have never said that I could perform miracles, but you said that I could. I ask a question about them. Let us understand also, as you made mention, there were certain gifts for certain people. I agree. 
uh, Paul himself was either unwilling or some such reason why he did not heal a companion who was near death. No person who claims to have the power of healing would should say it's them that are doing it. Well, we don't claim by their own power. Anybody did miracles. I have never come across anyone who states that. Well, fine, I haven't either. There are many reasons why some are healed and some are not, why God answers some prayer and not others. Now, this is where I wanted you to look, Ken, on that. what, they, what do they say concerning the church where he's a member, concerning miracles, the work of the Spirit. Okay, under the section uh, we believe, uh, it says concerning in the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit given to individuals and to the church. These ministries include apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. Okay, let me just go ahead then from there. Well, okay, you're in fellowship with those who make that claim. Now, I think I can conclude that without abusing what he said. Well, then you just have one of them that you know yourself by your own testimony works miracles as miracles are defined in the New Testament, as Paul did, as Peter did. Uh, whether it's speaking in languages you never studied, raising the dead, uh, anything like that. That's what we mean by miracle. We went into that in detail yesterday as to the definition of a miracle. And what, how it's used today. So whether you can or not, you're with those who say they can. Now, do you believe they can? You're with them. Do you believe they can work miracles like Jesus or like the apostles or those they lay hands on? Uh, evidently you do. So this other stuff is mere just window dressing. My question on prayer was only dealing with miracles. All right, same answer. Not providence. Well, fine. If you can't work them, you're with a group that says some can, then produce one of them that can, and you sit down until maybe you get that power. Uh, I've never denied baptism. I fully obey Scripture, yes, but in the group that you're with on their own page, they make it clear they're with a group and with a number of people who don't believe you have to be baptized to become a Christian. You have to be baptized to be saved. So obviously then, you can believe one thing, they can believe another on a matter that has to do with salvation. And yeah, who's right? It is not, and if the Bible is the infallible standard, James 1.25, does not give us who's right, then what good is all of this and what good are you doing? And then he goes ahead and says, we won't try to get into all of this. He says, I don't, what? You just read the statement. Okay, just read, read what he has. And this is coming directly from their side. We didn't write it. They did. The, the church is made up of all, regardless of denomination, nationality or color who have truly repented and have made Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. It does earlier state that they believe in baptism by total immersion for those confessing faith in Christ, but says nothing about baptism for the remission of sins. True. So they, it's obvious from that statement they believe you're baptized by immersion for the remission of sins, that's fine. But if you believe only and repent, well, that's fine. Because I know that because they say right there, everybody that claims to be a Christian, well, a whole lot of them just don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. And they consider them all Christians. Uh, you have a standard written by men that contradicts the New Testament. Amen. And that's what you're contending for. Now, the rest, I don't see if we've got more time to deal on this. He goes back to and says this, I don't agree with the reasoning of 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Well, okay, we agree or not. Yes, we can all call up sources back to claim. No, you can. That's the reason we want to debate, Ricky. You think you can. I don't deny that you think you can. <laughs> That's not the point. But in a debate where you have it discussed properly, as we proposed to you last year and was willing to bend as much as we could, having to spend the money and spend more time and all of that, uh, then uh, you just turned it down. You've got a whole host of folks over there that you believe can work miracles like Paul. Get them behind you. We don't. We deny they can. And we know they can't. So on these matters of how you think 1 Corinthians 13, 8 or 1 Corinthians 13, 12 or whatever, uh, we can't discuss all that right here. We did a pretty good job yesterday for the time we had. So please understand that. He goes ahead and says, and we'll quit. Um, 
by giving the fact in his job as a policeman, if time permits, shift patterns, other commitments. We knew that last year when we started. When we started making, as I said in the beginning of this, that we would have uh, a discussion with him. We were willing to try to work every way we could. But we knew also that he was reporting on the, on the um, uh, Internet that he was traveling here and there to preach and teach what he learned. Well, then why couldn't he have found some time to meet us when we were willing to come halfway around the world nearly and spend the money and, and do what we needed to? In fact, I imagine we would have had to have supplied the place in order to have had such a debate as we proposed. And we're still willing to do it. Let me say that again, Ricky. You know now... What we said last year, which is still in print, and we can reproduce it, that we would be glad to have a four-night debate, or if it takes three times on Saturday, one on Sunday, or one on Friday night, two on Saturday, and one on Sunday, we'll do our best. And uh, we'll enter into a discussion on things like this. We'll settle on the propositions. Now, if you are really interested in the truth and sacrifice all there is to find the truth of God for your salvation, if it's that important, and it is, then it seems to me... When we're willing to do what we're willing to do, you should be willing to do something. And surely that church, with all that it's got, like Jesus and the apostles had of the miraculous powers of the Holy Spirit, surely you can find somebody that will help you out on all of this. So we're going to dismiss here and go on to eat. Thank you. Yes, sir.